The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. My presentation today is going to be on reducing deck cracking in composite bridges by controlling long-term problems. So composite bridges combine the advantages of precast and cast in place concrete or steel and cast in place concrete. However, because of the difference in the shrinkage properties between the prefabricated and site installed components and because of the sequence of construction, the deck is subject to tensile stresses as a result of differential shrinkage. These tensile stresses may exceed the tensile strength of concrete and lead to the formation of cracks. Cracks provide easy access for water and de-icing chemicals which shorten the life of the deck, especially in bridges subject to aggressive environments. So there are generally two approaches that are taken in design with respect to concrete cracking. The first approach is to design concrete members not to crack under service loads, and to do that one has to identify the sources of cracking and the causes of cracking and take measures for it. Now these measures include designing not only for mechanical loads but also for the structural effects of restraint deformations such as differential settlements, shrinkage creep, temperature gradients, uniform and uniform changes in temperature. Other measures may include modifying concrete material properties, adjusting construction sequences and techniques and, and, and etc. Now the second approach is to allow cracking under service loads but to take measures to control it. And code provisions already uh, provide guidelines on the amount of reinforcing steel needed to control crack rates. Now a third approach might be a, an approach in which you combine both of these two approaches and take measures to reduce the likelihood of cracking but also include specifications to control crack widths if cracks were to occur. Now my presentation today is going to focus on the potential of differential shrinkage and shrinkage-induced creep on a composite bridge system, the potential that they have to cause cracking in bridges, and how we can calculate the stresses created as a result of these time-dependent effects, and what is it that we can do to alleviate the stresses. Okay, so Article 3.3.2 of AASHTO LRFD specifications classifies force effects due to shrinkage and creep as permanent loads and Table 3.4.1-1 in Ashton LRFD specifications stipulates the service and strength level load combinations which include the effects of shrinkage and creep. Okay, so shrinkage and creep or the structural effects of shrinkage and creep are things that we are supposed to design for. So how do we go about quantifying the structural effects of shrinkage and creep in a composite bridge system, for example? Okay, so uh, the initial stresses in a composite system can be calculated using the principles of linear elastic mechanics of materials. But what happens to these initial stresses over time as a result of the differential shrinkage that takes place between the cast-in-place deck and the precast girder? How do they influence the distribution of these stresses? So, for example, even in a single-span, simply supported bridge system, differential shrinkage between the deck and the girder is going to cause self-equilibrating stresses along the span of the bridge uh, at any given section. And the time-dependent strain that is shown in this, in this equation here at any given fiber can be calculated by summing the elastic and creep strains due to the, due to the initial stresses, the elastic and creep strains due to the changes in stress over time, and the shrink shrinkage strain. Now the second term can be substituted, the integral on the second term can be substituted by an algebraic expression if an aging coefficient mu is introduced. So just like we can calculate the time dependent strain at any given fiber, we can calculate the changes in axial strain, for example, at the centroid of the deck, or the change in the axial strain in the centroid of the, of the girder by simply summing the creep strain due to, due to the initial axial forces in the deck, the elastic and creep strains due to the changes in the axial forces in the deck and the shrinkage strain. 
Similarly, we can calculate the change in curvature by adding the creep curvature due to the initial moments in the deck, the elastic and creep curvatures due to the changes in these moments, and so forth. So we can do the same thing for the deck here. And because there are no externally applied forces, the sum of these axial forces and moments needs to be equal to zero because they are self-equilibrating. And because we're going to assume that there is a perfect bond between the deck and the girder, and because plane sections will tend to remain plane, we can relate the strains in the deck to those in the girder using the, using the change in curvature right here. So in this particular case, this leads to a set of, to a set of nine equations and nine unknowns which can be solved with the purpose of quantifying what these changes in axial forces and moments are in each component, deck and the girder, with the purpose of calculating the final stress distribution in this composite system. Okay, so the scope of this study is to demonstrate the potential for differential shrinkage to induce tensile stresses in the cast in place bridge deck in excess of the tensile strength of the concrete. And the second part is to recommend the deck mix that reduces the likelihood of cracking due to differential shrinkage. Um, so the first, the first goal to demonstrate the potential of differential shrinkage, this was done through numeric investigation by taking a voided slab system as an example. Uh, the second goal was, uh, was implemented by doing an experimental investigation because we're seeking such a concrete mix. It was done through an experimental investigation on seven deck mixes developed by the researchers at the Virginia Center for Transportation Innovation and Research and the third part of the goal was to investigate the relative performance of one traditional and two relatively new bridge systems for short to medium span bridges with respect to their resistance against these time dependent effects. And this was done through, through an analytical investigation using finite element analysis. So I'm going to first talk about this experimental investigation on the seven deck mixes. I'm going to present the results of the numeric investigation on the voided slab system. I'm going to conclude with the results from the Finite, finite element analysis on those three bridge systems. Okay, so the experiment, experimental investigations on the, on the seven deck mixes, because, a, because differential shrinkage has the potential to cause high enough tensile stresses in the cast in place deck to cause cracking, a deck mix with low shrinkage is obviously desirable. desirable. But also another property that is desirable is a mix with high creep, because high creep alleviates the tensile stresses created as a result of differential shrinkage. So we were, were seeking to find a concrete mix that has low shrinkage and high creep. So to do that, we investigated seven deck mixes, and those seven deck mixes consisted of uh, Portland cement, normal weight and lightweight coarse aggregates, normal weight and lightweight fine aggregates, the cementitious material for fly ash and blast furnace slag, and all the mixes were, were air entrained. Okay, so this slide here shows the development of the drying shrinkage strains for all the, all the seven deck mixes with time. And you can see that the mix that developed the lowest drying shrinkage strain was the mix with normal weight coarse aggregates and the saturated lightweight fine aggregates. It had a drying shrinkage strain at 100 days equal to 215 microstrain. We did the same comparison for Cree properties. And the metric that we're using here for creep properties is the creep coefficient because it is that coefficient that is used in the age-adjusted effective modulus method that I described uh, a, a couple of minutes ago. And in this, in this particular study, it just so happened that that very same mix that exhibited the lowest drying shrinkage also uh, exhibited the, the highest creep. However, it may not be always possible to, to find a mix that has low shrinkage and high creep. So in those cases, priority should be given to a mix with low shrinkage because it is the free shrinkage of the deck that serves as a catalyst to the creation of those tensile stresses in the deck because of differential shrinkage. Okay, so to demonstrate the structural effects of differential shrinkage and shrinkage-induced uh, sh creep, uh, a numeric investigation was carried out by considering this composite system here, which is a bridge system consisting of, of adjacent voided slabs and a cast-in-place topping. And the cross-sectional properties uh, shown in this slide were taken for, from a two-span bridge in Richmond, Virginia, uh, constructed last, last spring. And a time-dependent analysis was carried out with the purpose of quantifying this uh, time-dependent stresses in this composite system using the age-adjusted effective modulus method. Uh, for, the, 
precast void is slab, the long-term properties, the ultimate shrinkage strain and creep coefficient were taken equal to zero because the contract document specified an age of continuity equal to 90 days, which is considered to be a long enough time to allow the majority of the shrinkage and creep to take place in a component. And here are the results of that numeric investigation. So the first plot shows the initial stresses in the voided slab, which is the self-weight of the slab, the pre-stressing force, and the weight from the cast-in-place top. The second plot here shows the changes in stress over time as a result of differential shrinkage and shrinkage-induced creep. And the third plot shows the final stresses in this composite system. And you can see that it matters which topic mix is selected. For example, in this, this table here, shows a comparison between, between the maximum tensile stress at the bottom of the deck, which is right there, with the corresponding tensile strength of that mix. And you can see that the mix that supplies the lowest ratio is the mix with normal weight coarse aggregates and the saturated lightweight uh, fine aggregates, which is a, a ratio of 0 0.63. And you can also see that there's only two mixes that apply a ratio that is lower than one which means that if the other mixes are used, there is a potential that we're going to see transverse cracks along both spans of this bridge. Okay, so, so the method that I've described so far is a sectional analysis method, which means that it can, can be done one section at a time. However, for, for composite systems that may not be prismatic, for example, the voided slab system is prismatic in a longitudinal direction, but not in a transverse direction. We want to have an idea about the stresses in a three-dimensional stress state. How do they vary? How do these adjacent sections affect one another? So to answer that question, a finite element model was created, and the effects of differential shrinkage in the cast-in-place topping were stimulated by subjecting that topping to a uniform decrease in temperature. And you can see that in the longitudinal direction, which is the direction that this system is prismatic, the results from the hand calculation method that I described uh, so far, are pretty similar to those obtained from the finite element model. So the hand calculation method using the age adjust effective modulus does a reasonably good job in estimating time this, uh, the time dependent stresses as a result of shrinkage and creep. Okay, so uh, the other thing that we did was to compare the relative performance of the voided slab system when it comes to its resistance against crack due to time depend effect with two, with two other bridge systems. So this is the voided slab system. The second bridge system that was considered was a precast inverted T-beam with straight webs, which was identified during a scanning tour in France in 2004 and has been used in Minnesota on several bridges. And the third system is similar to the second one with the exception that the, that the webs are tapered and it was and this system was used for the first time in Virginia last spring. So you can see here that the most critical interface is between the, pre the top of the precast beam and the cast-in-place topping. That's where those tensile stresses are highest. So that interface becomes a little shorter in this system and even shorter in this particular system here. So reducing the length of that interface is, is crucial in reducing the potential of surface cracking in, in such a composite um, in such a composite bridge system. And you can see that figure 8C suggests that the precast inverted T-beam with the tapered webs features the, show is the, the shortest interface between the cast-in-place topping and the top of the precast beam web. Okay, so in addition to making a qualitative comparison between these three different bridge systems, we also looked at the magnitude of stresses in the transverse direction and in the longitudinal direction. So in the transverse direction, we noticed that there wasn't a pronounced difference between either the magnitude or the distribution of stresses between the three different bridge systems. They were similar. However, in the longitudinal direction, we can see that the precast inverted T-beam with the tapered webs features a lower uh, tensile stress at the bottom of the deck there, even top and bottom of the deck for that matter, compared to the other two bridge systems. So a lower tensile stress in the deck combined with a shorter critical interface um, is desirable from the standpoint of not only reducing the likelihood of cracking, but also reducing the extent of it. And this table at the bottom of the slide shows a comparison of the vulnerabi vulnerability of cracking of the three bridge systems in terms of a ratio between the maximum tensile stress at the bottom of the deck, which was right there, to the, to the tensile strength of concrete. And you can see that the precast inverted T-beams with the tapered webs 
features the lowest average ratio compared to the other uh, two bridge systems. So our conclusions, reducing the likelihood of deck cracking is essential in, in increasing the longevity of bridges. Differential shrinkage in composite bridges can cause tensile stresses in the deck that are in excess of the tensile strength of the concrete accordingly. It is recommended that the deck mix with low shrinkage and high creep is used. And in this study, that mix was the mix with um, normal weight coarse aggregates and saturated lightweight fine aggregates. And from the three bridge systems investigated, the inverted heat beam system with the tapered webs is most resistant to cracking due to the time depend effects that I described. Uh, this study was sponsored by the Virginia Department of Transportation. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you for a nice presentation, and, and I agree that mixed design is very important. When did you start measuring creep, uh, the creep values that you used? Seven days, after seven days. Okay. Okay. And what was the temperature difference that you applied to your model? Oh, uh, okay. So the change, the uniform change in temperature that was applied to the casting place topping was selected such that when that uniform change in temperature multiplied by the coefficient of thermal expansion of the topping, uh, was equal to the ultimate shrinkage strain of the topping that we measured experimentally. So it was just a roundabout way of inducing shrinkage in the topping. Uh, what prediction model? So uh, we used the experimental data in this case. So we had experimental data on the seven mixes, so we just used the actual experimental data. But in design, yeah, you have to pick a creep law or, or shrinkage Thank you.